So by combining all of these tricks, molecular dynamics, adaptive sampling, Markov state modeling, deep learning, etc., we can solve this system, uh, this protein-protein association dissociation problem in two with two milliseconds of simulation data. And in contrast to the one hour time it takes for a single dissociation, dissociation event, this is actually something we can do. So, but despite the fact that we are like 10,000 times more efficient than direct MD, we're still, this is still obscenely expensive. And to see that, consider that for two milliseconds of all atom MD in this system, we needed about 20,000 GPU days, or in other words, 500 gigajoules. And to see how much that is, compare that to the energy it takes to burn a Saturn V rocket and move a 50 ton payload to lunar orbit which is about 1500 gigajoules. So I think we're definitely burning too many rockets here and, and probably we can do much, much more efficiently than this. And because that is so, um, we are trying very different approaches to sampling such man many body systems. And here is a pro an approach that is very different from um, pretty much anything that is done in all atom molecular dynamic simulations or in, in, in simulation sciences in general. And uh, here we really try to develop a deep learning method that approaches the sampling problem much more directly. And the idea is that uh, since our uh, the system that we want to sample is defined via an energy function. So there's this energy function which models our molecular states and tells us in principle how probable these states are if we combine the energy function together with the definition of the thermodynamic ensemble such as the canonical ensemble for example in that case we have a Boltzmann distribution and that is e to the minus energy divided by kt for example okay and so now the idea is can we since this is in principle all defined so every state here that every state x that we can probe has a known probability density. It's just difficult to actually explore the space and sample it. Can we do this more directly with machine learning? And the idea here is to use generative sampling or generative uh, um, machine learning models for this problem. And um, generative learning, um, there are different types of generative learning. For example, a classical approach is uh, restrictive Boltzmann, Boltzmann machines. That's more like um, a sort of traditional sampling approach where you actually do learn an energy surface and then you do Monte Carlo updates in order to sample it. Um, but there is also this class of directed generative models, such as generative adversarial networks, variational autoencoders, and normalizing flows. And all of these have in common that uh, we want to learn uh, a probability distribution and we want to learn to sample it, okay? Um, and the idea is to uh, inject random variables from a simple distribution, such as an image where the pixel intensities are simply random noise, for example, sampled from a, from a Gaussian distribution, each of them independently. And we inject that into a feedforward neural network or another function that is trainable. And the aim is that at the output, we generate samples of the objects that we are interested in, such as samples of images of um, uh, VIPs or celebrities, if that is something that we are interested in. And here is an example where a normalizing flow was actually used in order to do that. This is the GLOW model, a few years old now, so these things are much better now. Um, but these are actually samples of images, of celebrity images, generated by the flow. So this is really completely generated by the machine. And uh, these people do not exist, but certainly they do look important. So the machine has clearly learned something about celebrities based on the images. Now we want to use this technology or to make it usable for sampling um, states of many body systems defined by a target energy. And here we use the techniques of normalizing flows. So in normalizing flows, we are learning an invertible neural network. So this is a bijection that is trainable. Okay, so for every point Z, we can generate an X, and for every X, we can go back to Z, and this is a unique mapping back and forth. 
Now we inject a prob samples from a probability distribution that is easy to sample from, such as a multivariate Gaussian distribution. And we want to generate, for example, the Boltzmann distribution. We use normalizing flow, so we use an invertible neural network because then we can use the transformation of random variables rule, which allows us to compute the probability density of every x that we sample, given the probability density of the z that we did input, and the Jacobian determinant of the network. So if the neural network allows us to compute the first derivatives and the determinant of the first derivatives, this Jacobian determinant, effect eff effectively or efficiently, then we can use this approach. Okay, and a Boltzmann generator now is basically such a flow that we train to a target energy, and in contrast to machine learning, uh, where, where ma what machine learning normally does, we are not necessarily interested in learning the probability distribution from already given samples or data points because we know the probability density up to a normalization constant. We just cannot sample it efficiently. So we actually want to make, uh, we want to start with as few samples from X as possible and we just want to make um, this distribution generated by the normalizing flow as similar as possible to the Boltzmann distribution. And um, then the second main difference to machine learning approaches to generative sampling is that we have a reweighting step here. So uh, we generate a probability distribution, then we reweight this probability distribution to the target distribution because we are interested in physics uh, to sample really unbiased uh, expectation values from a certain distribution that is very important for physicists. How can we construct such an invertible neural network? There is a whole zoo of approaches available. But let me just give you one simple example, um, which is quite uh, used quite a lot, and that is uh, the so-called coupling layers. For example, NICE or real NVP layers. And the idea is the following. We have these blocks here, so the blue and orange blocks are the blue and arrow, uh, orange blocks here in the deep network. And each of these blocks has input and output variables, and we split the variables into two sets. Okay, And these um, two sets are transformed as follows. The first set is not transformed at all, so we just copy it to the output, so that's trivial to invert. And the second set of variables, we just do some affine transformations, such as multiplications or additions, um, as a function of the first set. Yeah, so, for example, we do x2 multiplied with function s of x1, uh, or we add function t of x1. And function s and function t are now neural networks, for example, dense, trainable neural networks, and they are not invertible. And we don't need to invert them, because we can invert this multiplication or addition here in order to invert the xy direction. Yeah, and because x1 and y1 is equal, we can input y1 into s and t, and therefore we can invert this direction. And then we can stack these blocks deep. We can exchange y1, y2 after every such operation, so as to make sure to transform both channels. And we can stack these um, blocks deep, and therefore get a deep invertible neural network that is trainable. How do we train a Boltzmann generator? Well, also here I just want to give you the main idea. Um, the loss function that is minimized in order to train it actually, um, in, in, in order to make this practically work, consists of different parts. But the main idea is the following. So, as I said, we want to go from a prior distribution that we can easily sample from to a target distribution, and we want to match that to the Boltzmann distribution. And uh, we do that by, for example, minimizing the kullback leibler divergence, also known as relative entropy, between the generated distribution and the Boltzmann distribution. And if you work that out, um, it turns out that uh, the expression for such a kullback leibler divergence is the following. Um, and this is the expectation value over samples from the prior. Yeah, so here we sample z vectors from the multivariate Gaussian distribution, so this is easy to do. 
And then for each of these, we compute the following expression. This is the energy. Um, this is our molecular energy that we know. So we, uh, we have this energy function of the transformed variable. So we take the Z variable, we push it through the flow, we generate a candidate for molecular configuration, and we compute its energy. Uh, so we basically minimize the energies of the generated samples. So if we would only do that, we would just collapse to a um, some sort of minimum energy value. That's not what we want. So we have a second contribution here, which is basically minus the log determinant of um, the of, of the flow transformation. And it turns out that thermodynamically, this is an entropy. So we minimize an energy, but we maximize an entropy. So this entropy part um, prevents our probability distribution to collapse to a low energy point. And now we can do the same thing uh, the other way around. So if we have samples available in X, so if we have already some MD samples, for example, in different states that are relevant for our problem, we can transform back through our flow to the C variables and then uh, minimize the kullback leibler divergence to the Gaussian distribution there. And this is equivalent to maximum likelihood training. Okay, and then finally, when once we have trained the flow um, with a Boltzmann generator, we can, we, can, we can turn the flow into a Boltzmann generator by uh, using the flow to generate samples and then reweight them or resample them using Markov chain Monte Carlo, for example, in order to generate samples from our um, target distribution, the Boltzmann distribution. So let's see this in action. So here's first an example uh, from a two-dimensional space. So um, we have a double well potential here to minima with a high barrier in between. So it takes a long time to transition between these minima. And we start with points on the left and on the right, but without having seen any transitions between them. In this system, we should have many more samples on the left than right in equilibrium because this minimum is deeper, but we start with an equal number of samples. So basically, we're starting from the wrong starting distribution. Then we train this Boltzmann generator. So we transform this distribution into something that looks Gaussian in latent space, sample from it there, push forward to X, reweight, and then we can actually recover the true free energy along the X1 coordinate, so the free energy that's just minus the logarithm of the marginal distribution in x1. Okay. Another interesting point, what we can do is we can take two points here, so for example a blue and the and and red point, and then do a linear interpolation in z, um, and then push every point along this linear, in linear interpolation forward to x, and then of course that is nonlinear because that's nonlinear transformation and it turns out those are nonlinear pathways and they can be quite good approximations to reaction pathways to sort of pathways that go through high probability density. So this is the situation when we already have um, uh, data from the different metastable states that are of interest to us. But in many cases, we also want to explore. So we want to start maybe from one point and then find the other metastable states that are relevant. So the Boltzmann generator is basically a transformation method that allows if efficient and fast sampling of states that we already know. So it's not really an exploration method, but it can be coupled with exploration methods. And there is a ton of exploration methods around in, in molecular dynamics, such as metadynamics, replica exchange, or simply high temperature dynamics, or some bias dynamics, etc., etc. And here we do something very simple just to illustrate how this can work. So we start with one point. We learn a Boltzmann generator. So initially this will just generate samples close to this point because it doesn't know about this other state. But then what we do is we do Mon Ma uh, Metropolis Monte Carlo in latent space. So we do very simple Monte Carlo steps in this latent space where we simply sample from a Gaussian distribution around our current point with a standard deviation of one. And then we accept or reject um, with a metropolis step in X space. And because we can always go back and forth between C and X, we can always do that. We can always compute the acceptance probabilities. Then we may have found something new. We retrain and we sample again. We go in loops. And in this uh, system, you can easily see 
that uh, you, you, you sample both metastable states. This way you soon find the second minimum and then eventually uh, you can converge to the equilibrium distribution this way. And in more complicated systems, you might uh, need more clever exploration methods such as, as, as I said, metadynamics, um, replica exchange, et and so on. The strength here is you can now combine all of these things with latent space dynamics. Yeah, because the Boltzmann generator basically repackages probability density in latent space so that we have a compact representation of all the high probability states there, all of the metastable states are close together in, in this space, uh, um, sorry, in this space, um, we can reformulate those methods there and that may be more efficient than directly formulating them in X where we have not such a nice structure. Here is a more interesting example. So this is a uh, box with repulsive walls filled with repulsive particles with a 1 over r to the power of 12 potential. So these are very repulsive. You can't get them close to one another. And then we have two particles here that are special. This is sort of a dimer that can be um, closed together or extended. And in both states it's quite happy, but the transition state is a high energy barrier. So it's a rare event to open and close this dimer. And it's not easy to find moves, Monte Carlo moves to do this because it's a dense system. So in this state I couldn't simply open the dimer because I would run into solvent particles. Here I couldn't close the dimer because there are solvent particles in between. Um, but starting from these two systems, training the Boltzmann generator, we can efficiently sample the system and also find transition states. And uh, the interesting thing here is we can also do that directly for multiple temperatures. So we can train with multiple temperatures to the target energy. So we basically train to a family of Boltzmann distributions at different temperatures. And then we can directly generate at these different temperatures. And the way we do this is by scaling the latent space, um, so the Z variable. So we simply uh, uh, train such that increasing the variance in the Gaussians at the input is proportional to the temperature change. And for some flow architectures, this is actually an exact mapping. For the ones that we have used here, it's not exact, it's approximate, and therefore we need to uh, find this temperature steering by training it. And uh, the, the green lines that you see, see here were computed with umbrella sampling. So these are free energy profiles along the dimer distance at different uh, relative temperatures. So uh, the standard temperature, half that temperature and double that temperature. And uh, as you see, the Boltzmann generator samples correspond to the umbrella sampling simulations. How far can we push this approach? So um, here is an illustration. Then we can also hope to sample um, structures of peptides or small proteins. And uh, so this is a... Um, an illustration of a structure of BPTI, bovine pancreatic trypsin inhibitor, a small protein with about 1,000 atoms. And here is the all atom representation. And this is actually a sample, a one-shot sample from a Boltzmann generator. Yeah, so this was really generated by taking a, a sample from a 3,000 dimensional Gaussian, mapping it through a feed-forward neural network and getting this out in one shot. And uh, you can train Boltzmann generators to sample diverse structures, such as you see here. And here you see that the um, uh, chemical properties of these samples are, um, are decent. So you have reasonable um, uh, distributions in, in bond distances and bond angles, etc. And um, so this shows that um, with a sufficient number of tricks that we used here in order to encode the variable transformation between these x variables and the latent space variables, we can actually uh, really hope to sample um, polymer structures, peptide structures, maybe small proteins. Of course, there are limitations here, and that's very important to understand. So here, basically, um, the, the, the big advantage is that we don't need to do these tiny little MD steps to uh, move almost nowhere in an in, in affordable computational time. 
but we can do these IID samples. So, so we can directly sample from the Boltzmann distribution or from something that's similar to the Boltzmann distribution. So that's wonderful. But the disadvantage, of course, is that we will never train the Boltzmann generator to sample exactly from the Boltzmann distribution. So we will always uh, have a little bit different output distribution and therefore we need to reweight. So the second step is extremely important. But the larger the system is, the more differences we will have between these uh, two distributions, or the harder it will be to make them match. And therefore the acceptance rate of this reweighting step will go down. So there is um, there's a balance here between you know doing all atom MD and just doing one femtosecond at a time, uh, which is very inefficient, um, and it's still inefficient if we if we use uh, enhanced sampling methods and Markov state models and all of these tricks. And on the other hand, trying to sample the whole system in one shot and reweighting it, which can be very inefficient if we have very large systems, because we uh, eventually we don't accept samples anymore, right? So somewhere in between there is a sweet spot. And the idea is to use these approaches to exploit that sweet spot. And if you have a very large system, maybe break that down into subsystems, um, learn essentially clever Monte Carlo moves by applying Boltzmann generators to these subsystems and then updating the entire system in such a Gibbs sampling sort of approach. Here are a few examples of other researchers that use these ideas uh, such as Boltzmann generators in order to sample um, states for different systems such as uh, spin models of magnetic matter. This is for example done by Kim Nicoli, by uh, Klaus Robert Müller at TU Berlin and many others. And then here is an example of lattice quantum chromodynamics. So those are relativ relativistic models of the nuclear dynamics and uh, they are um, they give rise to very expensive and very complicated sampling problems in uh, in a lattice in four dimensional space time and for example Fiala Shanahan is working on that together with Kyle Grandma and um, Danilo Etzende and many others and so this is becoming a very important uh, topic in different branches of physics where a target distribution is defined by some sort of energy or some sort of path functional that we want to sample against.